Hello, and welcome back to the Endgame class. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and today I'm going to be walking you through some really interesting positions involving a rook against a bishop. And I actually have a book with me here today that I've been reading in my spare time. This is Volume 2 of Comprehensive Chess Endings by Averbach. Uh, and this is the book that inspired me to go over these positions here today. And when that book says comprehensive, let me tell you, it is comprehensive. Uh, so I took some interesting positions from it, and hopefully I'm going to condense it down to the important bits for you here today. Uh, like I said, the theme is the rook against the bishop in the pure endgame. So let's start off as simple as it gets. Here we do have, of course, a rook against a bishop. And if you know some things about this endgame, with no pawns on the board, it is tending to be a draw with a few exceptional circumstances. So I wanted to start off showing why it is a draw. The drawing idea here for uh, black involves actually putting the king in the corner that is the opposite color as the bishop. And while that might not seem intuitive at first, of course the idea is that the bishop is able to sort of guard the king from the two squares next to the corner. This is the drawing idea. And so no matter where white goes, black will simply stay on this long diagonal here, always keeping an eye on b8. Eventually, white is going to get bored and play rook f8 check, when after bishop b8, white, of course, has no way to improve his position here without stalemating uh, black for g8. This position is stalemate. If the king backs up, then king b7, check, king back to a8, king back to a6, and look at that. We've been here before. Uh, and so this is why this position is generally a draw for, uh, for black. He's able to keep the bishop on this diagonal and guard against the checkmates using this bishop coming back to b8. And of course, this works for any corner, uh, as chess is a symmetrical game. Uh, but now, let's examine the one or two uh, exceptional circumstances that would, uh, would allow white to win the game. And I'll talk to you a little bit later on about why it's actually important to know these. So of course, this is the safe corner that you, as you can tell, because it's opposite the color of the bishop. And what happens if the king gets put in the unsafe corner, the corner that is the same color as the bishop? Well, what happens is he quite often gets checkmated. So here we see a very, very similar position with the notable exception that the bishop is now the same color as the corner. So with white to move chat room, of course, how would white win this game? Uh, white to move, how do you win? How do you win if it is white to move? This is about as simple as the puzzles are going to get for tonight. Mm -mm. So yeah, rookie seven. Uh, so sorry, I actually have the position set up with black to move because it's a little bit more interesting. But let's triangulate here. Uh, rookie seven would do it. Uh, the bishop has to guard against checkmate and also not die. So king c8, of course, white would just capture the bishop. But if you go bishop g6, then rook g7 is going to win. Uh, this bishop can come back to f5 with the same uh, defensive idea that we've seen before. But now, after rook g8 check, bishop c8, the unfortunate news for black is his pieces are not shifted one square to the left. So after a passing move by white, this is not stalemate. Black is forced to play king a8, and then white can win the bishop on c8. So that's the general winning idea here for white, is you keep the king boxed in the corner, and then you're able to draw the rook away with a threat to the bishop and also a threat of checkmate. And black is unable to deal with both of these threats at the same time. Now, in the initial position, what do you guys think would be the most resistance here for black? How can black put up a fighting resistance in this case to try not to lose the game immediately? And then let's see if you can see how white might win anyways. So now the position is black to move. 
black to move here. What has changed? What can black possibly try to not lose the game? So yeah, there's only one move on the board that actually keeps the game going. If black passes on this diagonal, white has the same winning idea. If something like bishop b7, then of course this is hanging. If bishop a8, that doesn't really help. Now the rook to any of these squares is winning uh, because of the skewer. Uh, so bishop b1 must be played. Why does this move put up a little bit of resistance? Well, now, of course, if the rook tries to leave, he can no longer gain a tempo against the bishop, and the king could escape. And that would actually be a draw if the king manages to get out. So how do we win with white here? Well, the idea is, of course, quite simply, to draw the bishop out from behind the king. So you have this idea of playing rook c1 to challenge this bishop. The bishop can come to a2, notably if it goes anywhere along this diagonal. It gets met by the rook uh, chasing it with the same idea of checkmate to follow. Bishop g6, rook g1, bishop f7, and sorry, rook f1 would be a bit simpler, coming to f8 now with checkmate. So rook c1, the only move for black is to play bishop a2. Now, of course, if rook a1, the, we are not threatening checkmate, but rook a1 is still useful to draw the bishop further away. Now, once again, if something like bishop c4, how do we win? Well, the c file isn't quite the same as the other files for the bishop, because now, once again, white can threaten checkmate. What's the difference here? Well, the difference is if king c8, the bishop is on the c file, and white is able to win it. Uh, all of that is to say, of course, the, the, the ideas are the same if something like bishop d5, the rook can go to the same file as the bishop and find its way to the back rank with mate. So bishop b3 is the only option. And now, unfortunately, after the move rook a3, the bishop cannot go anywhere on the a file, and it cannot stay on the b file, which means it is forced either to a square where the rook can threaten both the bishop and come to the back rank with checkmate, some lightning fast arrow drawing, or it's forced to come to the c file, and we have the same winning idea that we just saw, with the rook coming back to c3 to, uh, to pin if necessary. And so all of that is to say, when the king gets put in the wrong corner like this, and we have him trapped there, white can always win the game. And that is very, very useful to know. Why is that useful to know? Well, we'll see that sometimes white uh, can use this idea to transpose from uh, a position with a pawn still on the board to a winning pure rook versus bishop endgame. And so it is useful to know this. There's one more checkmating position that I wanted to show off here, and that is a position like this. So this is a position where we have the kings opposite each other, and it is white to move. Of course, if it were black to move here, black would be able to draw by running away with the king towards, uh, well, just running away with the king, not running all the way to the wrong corner, but running far enough to not have checkmate being threatened immediately. So for example, let's just prove it. So black to move here, king e8 is the draw, running away. If king e6, then king d8, running further away. Now if king d6, well, you aren't making much progress anymore. If, uh, sorry, so king d8, if this move with check, now both king c8 and king e8 are still drawing, but we'll do king c8 for simplicity's sake. And now, of course, the key point is that after this check, sorry, the key point is that after this check, we do, uh, well, sorry, king d8 here would actually be a mistake because this move wins. OK, this wasn't supposed to be the main point. This always happens to me in these tricky endgame positions. Um, maybe king e8 would actually be uh, a bit simpler here. The idea being now we can check this king off of this square, which is threatening checkmate to our own king. All right, final answer. Uh, if something like rook d2, then bishop g4 check is the simplest, and checkmate is no longer being threatened, so white cannot win. Anyways, the initial position 
Uh, this is an important one to remember. And when I say that, I don't mean this position specifically. I mean pretty much any position where the kings are standing opposite each other and white has the potential to threaten a checkmate with the rook on the back rank. These are positions that white uh, can be winning in. And it's also important to remember this. So what is the winning idea for white? I'll give you guys at home uh, a moment or two to try and find it. Uh, likely the first move is going to be rather obvious, and we can sort of just take it move by move here. So how do we start? So yeah, the, the first move I'm seeing is rook e7, and of course rook e7 is actually in the wrong direction, because now after king g8, black is uh, very, very close to achieving this wrong corner defense. King g6 would now allow the only move to draw, bishop c6. Uh, if we go here, threatening the bishop in checkmate, there's a check. And at the end of the day, we do get to our famous corner. If rook e6, then anywhere on this diagonal, still keeping an eye on this, preparing to check the king next turn. And black is going to be able to, to set up. So what's the first move? So yes, of course the first move is in fact rook g3. It's so the same idea. We need to evict this bishop from behind our king so we can attack both the bishop and checkmate at the same time. Now, the game ends very quickly. If you come somewhere like bishop d5, the simple rook d3 with checkmate to follow, or at least we've seen this idea before. King has to move. We take the bishop. Uh, so the most resilience is to stay on the e-file, because then, of course, this is not checkmate. And here, the move rook e3 is good enough. The bishop now should still try and stay on these files next to the king to avoid the immediate checkmate. Once again, something like bishop h5 means rook h3. And here we can even pass with the king. Uh, all of that is to say that the bishop has to stay on these three files or else it will die. So bishop c4, rook e3, bishop g2. And now after rook e2, Bishop back to f3, the incredible move here to win for white. Who sees the winning idea to get rid of this bishop? Who sees how we can kill this bishop? Who sees it? I'll say yes. Hello to Adi in the chat. Hello to Joe. Rook b2 is possibly being suggested. Rook b2, I don't see the idea. I think um, it's another situation where the black king might be able to escape, either towards the center or towards the wrong corner. For example, rook b8 uh, is check. King h7, though, not sure where the threat is. So yeah, the, the last move, of course, is rook f2, and this is quite a tragic circumstance for the black pieces. Uh, of course, in order to draw, the bishop has to stay on these three files. Uh, these three squares are obviously guarded, and these two squares are indirectly guarded by the discovered check with the king. And in fact, there's no way to avoid this circumstance for black in this case. Uh, and so, once again, black would end up having to move the bishop away, then we move the rook to the same file, threaten checkmate and the bishop, and win the game. OK, so those are the two main winning positions that I want to show. And of course, there are other uh, you know, special cases, but I think these are the two most important. Uh, knowing that you can win when the king is in the wrong corner, and knowing that you can win when you have uh, the kings opposite each other like this with the bishop on the, the opposite colored square as the king. If the bishop were on the same colored square as the kings, um, let's say, for example, we had, let me make it white to move. <laughs> Oops, that's not good. We had this position. Uh, then, actually, I guess these positions are still winning because you can force the king. Uh, in this manner, and then you have the, the same position. Um, 
Okay, that would have been an interesting puzzle to include, but I wanted to highlight that this winning method works because the kings are on the opposite color as the bishop. Uh, if the kings are over one square, like we could see here. Oops. Someday I'll get there. Then uh, white can still win by virtue of this uh, rook e7 move with king, f king f6 to follow. I think, no, though, if the bishop were over here, then this, this wouldn't be winning anymore because black could, could run to the square. That was only winning because I put the bishop on a square where it could be captured after king f6. So the point is to say this position is important to know. Kings opposite each other, black king on the back rank, and the, uh, the bishop on the other color. No matter where this bishop is, by the way, if this bishop were over here somewhere, obviously then it's, it's a simpler win. So no matter where the bishop is for black in this case, when you can achieve this setup and it's your turn, you are able to win the game uh, because you can evict this bishop from behind your king. Okay, also, unsafe corner, those are the two winning positions. So now I want to move on to a slightly more complex position. So of course, without the pawn, these positions are always drawn now because the king is not in one of those special circumstances. But white has, oh, white has a pawn, so white should expect to be able to win this game. So I wanted to ask you guys at home what your immediate thoughts were on how to go about winning this position for white. How can you try to win this one? <clears throat> no need to memorize it, really? Yes, yeah, so you don't have to memorize it. Uh, you don't have to memorize the winning technique. Just try and understand that when the king's in the wrong corner, you should have some way to win, then you should be able to find it. And when the kings are opposite each other like that, you uh, can win with, with the same idea. You attack the bishop and, and threaten checkmate at the same time and can force the bishop to a square where you can do that. So two people in the chat room uh, say d5. One person says e5. I bet they mean d5. Uh, rook c1 has been suggested. King in front, says Joe Bruno, pushing the king to the back rank. Immediate thought is to push the pawn. Is it good to try to trade rook for bishop and go for king and pawn versus king? So a lot of you guys are making a big mistake, as Mike Kummer would say. D5 check is still a winning position, but it makes the king the it makes the win sort of absurdly more difficult than with the pawn on d4. And so I'm going to explain why that is in just a second. But first of all, when you get into any position like this, almost in any general endgame, and especially in these endgames where you have the rook. Uh, the position is much easier to win in all rook endgames when your king is in front of your own pawn. Uh, if the king is behind your own pawn and the enemy king is in front of it, it becomes much more difficult to win. So priority number one here for white is not to push his pawn up the board. Priority number one for white is to push his king up the board. And so with d5, you make that task much harder because your king no longer has access to the d5 square. So it's going to be more difficult to push the king. So of course, the uh, easy way to win these positions is to use the rook as a long range piece and push back the enemy king from the sides of the board. So you could go to a1 or you could go to h1 here. Uh, personally, h6 is a dark square, so I would choose a1 because our opponent's bishop is a dark square bishop. So rook a1 is a great way to start. The bishop might pass, for example. We can give rook a6 check bishop back to d6, and now the simple pass. And there's nothing to do here for black but cede some ground, king d5, and you start to see the, uh, the downfall of the black pieces here. Um, yeah, king c6, for example. And now, with the king out in front, this is a trivial win. We can checkmate using the king and pawn against the king, or simply queen our pawn by force. So this is a very, very easy win for white in most cases. When the pawn is back that far and your king is not behind it, then it's a pretty trivial win. However, I do want to talk about this position, because not, you won't necessarily 
always have your king in front of the pawn. So let us talk about the position after d5. Uh, king d7 is the way to go for black here. You want to keep the king in front of the pawn. And now, how do you win this position for white? There should be two squares that are very important in your mind. Two crucial squares that will change the outcome of the game. So two squares that would allow you to make progress. What squares are those? What squares are those? So the position is still winning. It's just a very difficult win. So a lot of different ideas are being thrown around. Uh, the closest I saw in the chat was e6 and c6. Of course, if you can get your king to those squares, then you win the game. But actually, in order to make progress, you want the king beside the pawn, right? We saw in this position the king beside the pawn. We control all these squares. We can bring the rook to the side and then advance our king very, very easily. So after the move d5, these are the two squares that become important. We get the king beside our pawn, uh, and it's able to stay there, notably not immediately be checked away. Then we can use the rook to force the king back, advance our king, and win the game. So e5 and c5 are the squares that you need in order to win this game. There's really no other way to force a win here unless you can force your king to one of those two squares. And it's not as easy as you might think to, uh, to achieve this. So a lot of you guys had some really good ideas to start attacking from the sides of the board. So let's start with the move rook g1, for example, right? The opponent is likely going to play this bishop somewhere. No reason to move this king back and forth. And so, for example, after bishop a5, you can give maybe two checks. And the question is, now, how do you ever get the, kings to, the king to e5 or c5? Well, king d4 might be a reasonable start, forking both squares, but bishop e1. And you can start to, you can start to see how it's actually going to be very, very annoying to get your king into one of those squares. Uh, because if you ever step to c5, bishop f2 check maintains the position. And if you ever step to e5, bishop c3 check maintains the position. And this is going to be the drawing technique now for black. So I want to ask you guys, you know, you might be thinking to yourself, wait a second, what's, what's the big deal? What's the big idea here? You know, you keep saying this nonsense about having to push my king to e5 or c5, but, but come on, Caleb, you just play d6, you play king d5 next, or you run the king up, the, you win the game. What's the big deal? So my question, chat, is black to move after d6, and it is, in fact, black to move and draw. And this is the key defensive idea that uh, black can use to uh, maintain the position here. Black to move and draw in this position. Bishop b4 has been suggested. King c6 has been suggested. And yeah, bishop b4 is not enough because king d5 and rook uh, g7 to follow, or of course rook h6 to h7 to follow. Uh, but king c6 is surprisingly uh, a dead, dead draw. There's nothing white can do here to advance this pawn any further, or in fact to even keep this pawn. King e5, and the key idea now is you don't allow king e6 by playing the move bishop b4. King e6 now would mean bishop takes d6, and you have nothing better to do with your time than pass back and forth forever, or eventually blunder your rook to bishop c3 check with a draw. So that is the key point. This is why pawn d6 is almost never, uh, never going to be winning for white in these positions. And the idea holds true if we go forward a little bit in this position here king d4, and the bishop can come back to b4. 
right? So this is always going to be good enough for black. One more position. Here, actually, with the bishop on such a bad square, this would be winning, because there's no way to stop this. You can't attack the pawn. I was trying to highlight that in like every case, it's uh, a draw for black. But it is only a draw if the bishop can come back to b4, or I think to b8, or even f8 if it is black, or if it is white, if it is f8 sometimes. It depends on whose turn it is. I don't remember whose turn. But f8 usually doesn't come into play. It's usually this square b4 or that square b8. So let's take a look at it with the bishop on b8, for example. Um, let's say this happens, d6. Uh, now, king c6. OK, well, I keep doing a bad job. <laughs> Sorry. OK, here, d6, uh, king c6. And I'm still doing a bad job because I'm hanging my bishop. The point is, this position is also a, a draw. Uh, if it is black to move, in this case, you can't pass with the bishop, but you can pass with king to c5. I uh, was just struggling to get it set up. So once again, after bishop a5, if we go all the way back here, the point is d6 is a draw in these positions, thanks to king c6, followed by bishop b4, with pressure on the pawn. So instead, white has to try very, very hard to win this game. King d4, for example, bishop e1, and now, believe it or not, the only three, the only four moves that make progress are rook g8, are these four moves. These are the only ones that make progress. And the reason is you want to uh, have your opponent place his king onto the d6 square, and then you want to go rook g2. And the point is, as in the other cases, you want to start taking away these squares from the enemy bishop. The downside is, it's just so much more difficult when the bishop has so many squares. Uh, so now, if something like bishop h4, the game ends very quickly, rook g6 check, and we get to one of our key squares, right? The bishop can't check us off, so we would win. The most resilience by black is bishop b4, and now after rook g6 check, king d7, we can't go king e5 because of bishop c3, we can't go king c5 because that square is defended, and if something like king c4, then you're asking for a repetition here. OK. So for example, in this position now, the best way to play is rook g6 check, king d7. And believe it or not, we need to waste another tempo now with rook h6, which I know seems a little bit absurd. If black tries to pass with the same ideas, now we go rook h1. And after bishop f2, we go king e4 king d6, for example, and rook f1 is the idea now. Bishop h4 and rook g1 is the idea now. If bishop f2, we go check, and we made it to our square. So you can kind of see how it's ridiculously difficult to win these positions. So rather than go through every possible continuation by black here, the point is, it can be done if you absolutely have to do it. And the way to do it is to take away these squares from the bishop. And eventually, you are able to sort of break free. But if at all possible, you should try to avoid it. Because like bishop g3 is also playable, then rook g1. Bishop can come back to c7. Check again. Check again. King d4, but like bishop f4. And you see it's. It's just so complicated, man. Like, I can't describe to you how complicated it is. Rook g2 to take away squares. Bishop back to b8, but now rook g7 check. And all of a sudden, you've interfered with the coordination between your enemy's pieces. Bishop c7, rook g6, king c5. And you got to one of the squares. Then as for how you win from here, of course, it's the same as before. You just uh, evict the king and put your king in front of your pawn. Moral of the story is, don't push your pawns willy-nilly in rook endgames. Push your king instead, and it will be much better. So any questions about this in particular? Uh, obviously, it's a lot of specifics and a lot of, uh, sorry, a lot of 
you know, taking it move by move, taking away squares from the bishop, and it's, it looks a little bit complex and sort of arbitrary, but you know, the method is, is just taking away squares from the bishop and trying to put your opponent into a zugzwang, so the bishop has to move to a suboptimal square, allowing your king through. But any questions on this, any potential winning ideas that you think I didn't mention, any potential drawing ideas that you think I didn't mention? Can't you just trade the rook for the bishop? So of course, that is a key idea to try and go for uh, winning king and pawn endgames. But of course, with the king behind the pawn, the enemy king in front of the pawn, this endgame is just a draw. Hopefully, most of us know this one. Stalemate. Um, OK. Well then, everybody loves center pawns. Why not talk about the bishop pawns as well? Uh, <laughs> so once again, the win is trivial here if you push the king first. Rook h1, bishop g4, rook h6, king c7, king c5. And the win is trivial. Check. And push, 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 push. Easy peasy, right? But once again now, if you push the move c5, the win is going to be very, very difficult once again. And the idea is, is going to be the same. Uh, you need to push the bishop out from, uh, from controlling these two key squares. Uh, so just to quickly go through some of it, king c7, for example, rook h1, bishop a4, King c4. This, just to give you an idea of what it might look, might look like, rook e6 actually ends up being a key move here. Of course, if the position were flipped, it would be rook d6. Because the move, or the, the e2 square, ends up being really important for the bishop. So now, for example, if bishop d1, we could go king b5. So rook e6, in a sense, has prevented the move bishop d1 by controlling e2 which leaves bishop c2 as the only good pass for black. Now after rook e2, if bishop d1, we would have rook e7 check, and the same idea here. If king over there, then we can win the bishop. So king c7, king b5. So not bishop d1, but bishop back to a4. Notably, if the bishop goes this way, we are able to step to this square. If the bishop goes to g6, then we have this idea. So bishop a4 is best. Now rook a2. And if the bishop steps to d1, uh, once again, we are controlling e2. So the bishop has to go back to e8. And we are chasing this bishop all over the board. Rook h7 now is the best move. And yeah, this one I'm even struggling with. There's bishop f7 check because this is stalemate. That's wild. But king b4 should be good enough. Bishop back to e8, rook h6 check. King c7, and now after king a5, we are actually able to invade here. Bishop c6, for example, means rook h7 check. And king b7 means rook over to e6. With the same idea. Bishop h5 would mean c6 check. And now we have one of those situations where Black is unable to prevent rook e7 check to follow. Unable to play uh, king b6, it would be, for the drawing idea. Obviously, that's not playable in this position. So just giving you an idea of how crazy complicated those positions are. However, I have good news for you. While those four pawns are stupid hard to win with, knight pawns are a little bit different. So if you find yourself in a very similar situation, with the knight pawn, there is actually a much easier winning idea. And this is why at the top of the hour, I showed you those basic uh, winning uh, positions in the pure rook versus bishop endgame. And you can use those to your advantage if you find yourself in a position with a knight pawn like this. So now, we've already given up, uh, we've already played the move b5, and so previously, with the bishop pawns and the center pawns, we would have to get our king to one of these two squares, right? That was the only way to make progress. However, in this case, there's one more. 
So let's play a few moves that are just natural. Rook g1, for example. Of course, if king c5 here, there's bishop b6. So rook g1, bishop f4, rook g7 check, rook g6 check. And now I'll present it as a puzzle to you guys. White to move and make significant progress. White to move and essentially win the game on the spot here. What do you guys got? What you got? White to move and win. So obviously, like every move wins besides like, you know, hanging stuff. But uh, so yeah, the, the chat room has it. So the idea is b6. And the chat room said and king b5. But if you remember, king a6 was drawing the game. This was the drawing idea that we saw for the bishop pawns and the rook pawns. If you try to push this pawn too early uh, without the king there to support it, then you get met with this idea. King steps down and bishop here to follow. So what's the, uh, what's the big idea, you guys? What's the big idea here? What's the, what's the big idea? Why is this one winning still for white? Well, of course, sorry, my phone shut off. That's how I'm reading the chat. The idea is you go king c5, this bishop checks you, king c6, this bishop takes your pawn for free. But ah, ah, what's this? This is starting to look familiar. Starting to look a little bit familiar, is it not? And so of course this is very similar to this position that we saw. We have the kings opposite each other and are able to uh, checkmate the enemy king. So back here, the easy checkmate is to go rook g2. And now, due to the unfortunate placement of this bishop, white is simply winning. King a5, for example, rook a2 check, and takes. If pass, rook a2 check, and we've seen this one before, right? So this b6 move is actually a very easy way to win if you do have a knight pawn, not a bishop pawn or center pawn. Interesting stuff. Uh, so knight pawns, easy peasy, doesn't matter what you do. OK, let's look now at the rook pawn briefly as well. So this is uh, basically all I'm doing is pushing this pawn and all the pieces over one file with each new position that we look at. So let's check it out with, with the rook pawn now, with the rook pawn already on the fifth rank. So what are some winning ideas here? Well, once again, we can resort to bringing the rook over to a square like g1 and bringing the king up now to some place like c5. Notably, if king a6, king b4 defends for the moment, Give this check, and now king c5. So we bring the rook up to the side and then advance our king. And what's the point here? Black can sort of stubbornly try and defend this guy. So white to move and win once again. White to move and win here. What is on the minds of the lovely chat room? Okay, people are saying king b5. I, I, don't, I don't understand. Don't understand. Maybe they were saying that earlier. So yeah, a6 is once again the winning idea. But you have to be careful. It's a free pawn. How do you win this position? How do you win this position? You gave up your, you gave up your pawn, dude. What are you doing? That was your pawn. <laughs> your pawn's dead now. Why'd you let your pawn die? Why did you let your pawn die? So if king c6 and something like bishop c4, for example, how are you winning?
Rest in peace. Everybody type, press F in the chat for the pawn. You let him die. He was your pawn. He was your boy. It's your baby queen right there. He's gone. So the easy way to win is, in fact, rook f7 check, king b8. And we can actually come to b6 with tempo on the bishop. And uh, white is now, of course, threatening checkmate and to take the bishop as well. Uh, you astutely noted that king c6 is actually winning as well. Why is that? Well, it's because we have the king trapped in the wrong corner. And so we know that these positions are winning. How do we know that they're winning? Because we've uh, seen the winning idea here, right? We have to evict the bishop from these spaces behind our king. We can do so with rook g6, bishop uh, h7, for example, rook g7, and bam. We take the bishop. If here, rook g7, and it's the same idea, just rotated, so the bishop can't go to any of these squares. And if it goes here, we've seen this idea before. So you see how useful it is to know those basic, basic endgames, where if you have the kings opposite each other, or the king in the wrong corner, you can win. Because then, that means you don't have to remember how to win this god-awful position, you just push a6, and you're like, you're in the wrong corner, stupid. All right, now, I have changed the position slightly. I have changed the position slightly. And so, this one, uh, the bishop is now not the same color as the corner square. And what does that mean? Well, that means that this position is actually just a dead draw, even with the extra pawn, even with the extra pawn. With black in front of the pawn, the position is just easily drawn. You can check, bring the king up, but this bishop's going to pass here forever. After a6, once again, the bishop just passes on this diagonal, doesn't let this pawn advance. We can check, but king a8, king c6 does nothing. We continue to pass. If a7, the simple captures. If a7 here captures here, then bishop b8 is drawing the game. If this rook, well, bishop d4 also draws the game here, I should say. But if I had this rook on a slightly better square, for example, then bishop b8 would be the key point here. And the bishop has made its way to the defensive diagonal. We can't go rook g8 because it's a stalemate. And the game is a draw. So I did want to highlight that, that if the bishop is the opposite color as the corner, you must, 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 must get the king in front of your pawn first uh, because many of these positions are just dead drawn. So what have I shown so far? I've shown the pure positions, and I've also shown that it's easy to win if you get your king uh, laterally with your pawn here. And I've shown that it is winnable, but it is very difficult to win if you push the pawn in front of your king on the fifth rank. Now. While this position is very, very complex, I have some good news for you, all right? This is, you know, sort of your, your break for the lecture here, right? You know, all those positions where your king was stuck behind the pawn with the pawn so far advanced were like crazy difficult. The good news is if your pawn is on the fourth rank or below, the win is actually much, much simpler. And what's the reason for that? What do you guys think? What does the pawn being less far advanced actually do for us? Why is the win easier here? And that might actually lead you to the winning method. So what makes this win much easier? Just get the king up. Just get the king up, dude. Just get the king up. Just all those other positions, too. Just get the king up, right? So. We have our key squares, right? We have our key squares. And in the previous positions, we had to go uh, this way with the rook. And then, for example, you know, try and get our king over. But it was always rather difficult, right? You check from the side, but king e3, you check again. And it seems like we actually have less space to work with to get our king out. If you start going king c2, uh, you might live to regret it. Uh, bringing your king over this way is actually not making any progress, right? Not making much progress at all here. Uh, OK, so why is the win easier? What's different? King f2, you get checked, right? You get checked. 
And once again, once again, it's not so easy. Not so easy. So yeah, the fact that the pawn can go one or two squares actually doesn't make a difference here, because we want our king in front of the pawn. We don't want the pawn to go. We want our king to go. Um, so it's actually a, a pretty tricky idea here. The idea is, in these positions, the king is controlling these three squares. Right? The squares immediately around the king are all controlled. So we have to, have to, have to check the king from this side. And it turns out that when the pawns are not so far advanced, we can in fact check the king from behind. And this turns out to be really useful. Uh, because when we check the king from behind like this, we force it to pick a side, leaving one of the other sides sort of uh, underdefended. And in addition to that, our rook does a great job of defending our pawn. So we don't have to worry so much about that as well. So for example, bishop g3 check, king d2 check. I'll even play king back to d1. Let's say bishop g5. We check from behind. Black has to pick a side. And then we go the other way and are easily winning the game. Uh, bishop f4, for example. King f2. Bishop b5. Uh, here we could even capture, I guess. But let's say a better move. We bring the king up, right? Does this make sense? King is easily brought in front of the pawn here. So we check from behind whenever possible. Wasn't possible at first because our pawns were too far advanced, but it is possible here. Um, let's take a look now at a similar position, which I didn't bother to input. Let's just move all the pieces back. Um, yeah, here for example. And yeah, wait to move here. So once again, with the pawn on the fourth rank, for the moment, we can't advance the king up because black is still controlling those squares. But we do still have this opportunity to actually check the king from behind, and this turns out to be very relevant. Notably, if the king tries to step up here, we are very happy to bring the rook away. Actually, bring the rook away with tempo on the bishop. The bishop moves, and then we are invading. Uh, notably here also, rook g8, king f7. This one is going to be a w for white. So even when the pawn's on the fourth rank, you can go back to this idea of checking from behind. It's just the most apparent with this pawn all the way back here. Uh, OK, any questions on this idea of checking from behind? Because this is a really useful idea. Really useful. All right, Storm, we'll get to that in just a bit. Analyze Your Games, of course, is coming up right after this on Twitch. Um, OK, so checking from behind, really useful. So what have we gone over now? We've gone over the pawns on all these ranks when they're back here. You check from behind, easy win. We've gone over the pawns on the fifth ranks, the fifth rank, when the king is in front of the pawn, of course, easy win. Beside the pawn, easy win. When the pawn's in front of the king, not so easy, right? Not so easy, except in the case of the knight pawn and the rook pawn when the bishop is the wrong color. Or the right color? I don't know. But now let us look finally at the pawn on the sixth file. So with the pawn on the sixth file, once again, the position is going to be winning in some cases not going to be the case in other case in other cases makes sense right uh, so with the pawn on the central file actually the the win is still going to be rather difficult here we have bishop f2 for example just passing uh, rook d7 check means king e8 and once again we're going to have to do this dance of trying to fight against the enemy bishop to get our king to one of these squares, right? Taking away squares bit by bit by bit. Bishop a3, rook a2, bishop back to b4, rook a4. This check would allow king d6, so bishop e1 now. But now rook e4. And yeah, things get a little bit, a little bit crazy. Bishop c3 check, but king d6, and you can see we finally won the battle, right? We finally got our king up to uh, up to the square. And now if you want to score style points, you play king e6 here. 
and we've seen this win before, right? We've seen this win before. So it's all about getting the pawn up to the seventh rank once again. Um, in fact, actually, is there an easier win here? I think there might be. So for example, let's go to b1, because I want to aim for a light square. We give this check, king d8, and we can actually play the move e7 here. And what's the idea after, um, after king f7? What's the win here with the pawn on the sixth rank? If you don't want to do the dance, then you have to be able to find the win here. So white to move and win in this position. I mean the sixth rank. I don't know what I said, but I meant the sixth rank. Pawn sacrifice and king e6. Not quite. Not quite. You give up this pawn. King here. King e6. King d8. Going towards the safe corner. Not the unsafe corner that we know and love. And it is a draw. So the only move to win here. The only move to win. Play any other move. If you waste a turn, bam. Bishop c5, I take this guy, game's a draw. The only move to win is rook d7. Why is this the only move to win? Well, because now he goes to the unsafe corner. Of course, if he wastes time with the bishop, we can evict this bishop from behind our king. Everybody loves this tactic. Everybody loves this tactic. We've seen it a million times before now. And so king f 8s the only try. But now, what move do we have? We have rook f7 check. If king e8, we fork. If king g8, now the only move to win. We want to achieve this position. So the only move to win is king f6 and king g6. And we have our opponent checkmated. So uh, you can still fall back on these checkmating ideas when the pawn is advanced to the sixth rank. OK, let's check out the bishop file now. And the bishop file, when the pawn is on the sixth rank like this and the opponent has blockaded, this one is actually just a dead draw. So bishop's pawns, kind of the worst. Kind of the worst. Uh, and the reason is, with the pawn on the fifth rank, we were still able to win because the diagonal for defense was actually, I believe, one, uh, one square shorter on behind the pawn. And now with the pawn on the sixth, white or black has just a little bit of extra maneuvering room to maintain the blockade here. And what happens if we fall back on this plan of check and uh, advancing this pawn? Well, the point is that in the other position, black could not always keep a hold of this uh, this square, whereas here he can. If f7, then black to move and draw in this position. Black to move and draw. Black to move and draw. So I don't want to spend too much time. We've only got five minutes left. Of course, king g7. Not taking here, falling for the trap. Don't fall for the trap. We know this one. But king g7. And now the point is, after f8 queen, king f6, uh, we can go to the safe corner and draw the game. Game, draw. All right, now let's lastly look at the knight file. And then I have a funny position that I want to show you. So here, once again, you can go rook e7 check, king g8, g7, and king h7 is not enough to draw because we can go back to this drawn position that we already know. Rook f7, queen, king, stuck in the wrong corner, right? Everybody knows it. And then the position I want to end on is a position uh, by Troitsky back in 19, or 18, not, not 19, 1898, he found this position. And believe it or not, this position is white to move and draw the game. So of course, this is wildly different than anything we've seen so far. 
Uh, of course, in any position where the white king is so far away from the pawn, it should generally always just be an easy win for black. Uh, but not so here. White to move and draw the game. What do you guys think to end on? Danilo says, so the secret is to have the pawn on the same color of the opposite bishop before you reach the sixth rank. No, the idea is you never have to worry about any of that if you get your king in front of the pawn. Just get your king in front of the pawn first, right? If you're in a position where you can worry about those things, then worry about getting your king in front of the pawn first. Um, otherwise, if you're forced into some position where your pawn's already so far advanced and your king's behind it, then that's when you need to start worrying about this, this other stuff. Okay, there's some uh, ideas in the chat. King a5 suggested, bishop d5 check suggested. So let's think about it here. Let's think about it, right? How does black win the game? Well, if white steps to a file that is not in, quote unquote, the king's shadow, those of you out there, king's shadow, anybody know that term? Uh, then, of course, black checks and queens the next turn. Unstoppable, right? So white's idea, of course, is going to be to stay in the king's shadow. Now, how else can black win? Well, if black puts his king there, then he moves the rook and queens, right? So those are black's two winning ideas. So whatever you come up with with white has to play against those two ideas here to... Uh, to solve the study. Well, Storm GD, under FIDE rules, I believe if black were to flag in this position, white would be granted a full point victory. Of course, because the G-pawn could promote to a knight, and then black could checkmate himself in a corner. Everybody knows. Everybody knows that one. And yeah, so the solution, if you want to not spoil it for yourself, go ahead, pause now. Uh, as someone has said in the chat, is to play the move bishop f3. This is the only move that prevents black's plan of coming to f2. How does it do it? Well, the only way to make progress, you can't move this rook, otherwise the pawn will fall. You have to play king b2. White's play is very simple from here on out. You have to stay in front of the king. And at the end of the day, King can step back, but we'll just repeat. King e1, king e3, king f1. And now, black would love to play the move rook h1, but he just doesn't have time. Bishop e2 check, king e1, bishop f3, and draw. And so I thought that was a really fun puzzle that I wanted to end on. Um, I do want to mention that... Um, uh, of course, once again, I got most of these, or some of these positions, actually, I think like maybe four of them, were from this book, Comprehensive Chess Endings. That's what I'm reading these days. And a lot of the stuff with the checkmating positions and the pure uh, rook versus bishop stuff was originally found by Horwitz and Kling back in 1851. And then that position with the d-pawn was actually from Philidor way back in 1777. Wanted to throw those out there to make sure I gave some credit to where those positions were coming from. That is going to do it for the end game class here tonight. Hopefully you guys learned everything that you ever wanted to know and some stuff you didn't want to know about rooks versus bishops in these pure end games with no pawns or one pawn for the attacking side. That is going to do it for us here tonight. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.